Okay, welcome today to a class on France's bacon. <clears throat> now, firstly, I want to straight away make it clear that France's bacon is not Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon is another philosopher, and he's very easily confused with Francis because he was uh, arguing in favour of very, a very similar position much earlier as well, 300 years earlier. Roger Bacon was around in the 13th century, like um, Thomas Aquinas. Whereas Francis Bacon was around in the 16th, 17th century at the turn, yeah, about 1600s, yeah, early 1600s, late 1500s was Francis Bacon. Now, they both argued similar things, and that's why it's easy to model them up. But I want to make it clear that Roger Bacon is famous for being the first person in Europe, I believe, to um, write down, well, <laughs> let's not put it like that, he is one person who we know had written down a gunpowder recipe. And this is the very well-known gunpowder recipe that we still use um, today. Yeah, which is like saltpeter of a certain proportion, that's potassium nitrate, mixed with charcoal. They used to use charcoal, but you can use sugar or anything else with a lot of carbon in it. And so that's the gunpowder recipe, and that's what Roger Bacon is, well, it's one thing that Roger Bacon is famous for. He wrote it down, and we still have that piece of writing where he recorded his gunpowder recipe. And so that shows us that gunpowder was definitely in Europe in the 13th century. Um, and Roger Bacon said some of these things. He said that knowledge of languages is the doorway to wisdom, so he was very into languages and grammar. He also said, or maybe he did, I might be mixing, you know, sometimes you find quotes and you think they, I, this could be Francis Bacon because Francis Bacon certainly said something similar. It is easier for a man to burn down his house than get rid of his prejudices. And we will see something very similar in Francis Bacon. Grammar is one and the same in all languages, though it may vary accidentally in each of them. Now I teach a, uh, a lot of English grammar and I happen to agree that grammar is the same in different languages. You know, you have adjectives, nouns, verbs, participles, gerunds in different languages. And so I do agree that grammar is one and the same in various languages. And this means that some people might argue that grammar is innate, that it's some kind of innate a priori knowledge. You know, it's something that you don't need to learn, but is already inside of you, perhaps in your genetics or something like that. Chomsky is famous for arguing this, that grammar is in some way genetic. Um, and, uh, you know, at, the, at this time, Descartes was certainly suggesting that mathematics um, in some kind of way was self-evident. And so some people were suggesting that mathematics was innate, that it was some kind of innate knowledge in comparison with empirical knowledge. OK, and Roger Bacon also spoke about maths. He said knowledge of mathematical things is almost innate in us. And that's interesting because I want you to think about where, whether knowledge is innate, whether some forms of knowledge, such as mathematical knowledge, is innate or not. Yeah, is it something we have to learn or is it something that's already inside of us in some kind of way? And uh, it's it's something which is realised through our life. Now, I happen to think this word innate is not a very good word. It's perhaps not very clearly defined. I'm going to criticise the word innate in the same way that Francis Bacon criticises how we use language, because Francis Bacon says that some of our words are ill-defined. And I think that this could be true with innate. You know, what does it actually mean if some if knowledge is innate? I mean, because nobody has it when they're two months old, three months old, nobody has any knowledge then, do they? And so, yeah, I'm not sure that we really understand what we mean when we say innate. Lastly, Roger Bacon said, the things of this world can't be known without a knowledge of mathematics. And again, this is something which I think, especially nowadays, we can certainly appreciate, yeah? There is no science without mathematics, really. You do need mathematics in all the sciences. And the way we get to know the world or the way we build a model, a scientific model of the world, is certainly with a knowledge of mathematics. It's absolutely essential. OK, so that's Roger Bacon. Please don't mix him up with Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon liked Roger. <laughs> you know, he liked what Roger was saying. And uh, Francis Bacon argues something very similar. 
Now, the best way to understand one philosopher is very often to compare him to another philosopher that disagrees. And so let's compare Francis Bacon with Descartes, because both of them were really interested in scientific knowledge. Yeah, Descartes was a scientist and a mathematician. A very famous mathematician, made a lot of great strides forward in mathematics. Now, Bacon uh, knew a lot about mathematics. I think he, was, he knew a lot about ciphers and things like that as well. But, and, and he was certainly fascinated by science. And he wrote a book about a new approach to science that would differ from Aristotle's approach to science. But they, they actually uh, come to very different, almost polar opposite positions um, in, in terms of what they think about knowledge, what are the limits of knowledge, you know, about epistemology. So Descartes was a rationalist, and a rationalist is somebody who believes that we can get knowledge um, without the senses. We can get knowledge, we can come to some firm conclusions without the senses, without um, any kind of empirical process. In other words, we can get knowledge from deduction and not from induction. Yeah, we'll see the difference in a second over here. But uh, Descartes employs deduction, and we saw that in his essay that he employed deduction. He was trying to find, you know, he was trying to find the limits of knowledge, just like Bacon, but he decided that the best way to do that, to make sure that he wasn't being fooled, was to doubt everything and see what he was left with. And this was a deductive process, certainly. Um, he was looking for self-evident truths. In other words, he was looking for a priori knowledge. A priori means not empirical knowledge, you might say. It means innate yeah, knowledge. It means something which is already true very often in virtue of itself, in virtue of the way it's written, which is why I like the word self-evident for, for things like mathematics. Yeah, two plus two equals four is a self-evident truth.